I'm going to be talking about looking at our doctrines in the light of a stepladder. But first, I'm going to ask whether we can request the Lord's blessing on our words. Our Father, I pray that thou wilt send thy Holy Spirit to assist us this afternoon in the understanding that we have and in the choice of the words. And so I ask that a blessing may come upon us all this afternoon. In the name of Jesus, amen. I know that many people feel that doctrines are a problem. Doctrines are divisive. And I know that they wonder what life would be like if we didn't have to have doctrines. If we just had love, for instance, and we were all kind to each other, we were all just affectionate to one another, wouldn't it be a much better church family? And I've heard people say this, but I want to suggest something to you this afternoon. Gordon and I went, not long ago, to a monkey sanctuary. And that monkey sanctuary had some little creatures in it that looked quite human. In fact, they were eating a vegan diet. And it was a beautiful diet. There was pineapple, and there was grains, there were corns, there was apple, everything you could think of, and they were picking it up so delicately to eat. And where we were, the monkeys were quite tame, and you could actually walk in amongst them, and if you sat down on a seat, the monkeys would come and talk to you. And we sat down on a bench, so you can imagine me in the middle, and there was Gordon on this side, and a monkey on this side. Now, I'm not trying to be humorous here, but I had two very nice human-looking people on either side of me. I had one that loved me, one that was a very nice man, and I also had another young man on the other side of me who had eyes and a nose and a mouth and little hands, and the little hands came and rested on my arm, and which one of those had the image of God? It was Gordon that was made in the image of God. But the monkey looked so much like us, but it wasn't completely human. It didn't have that something special. Because when you looked into the monkey's eyes, there was just no recognition. It was just living life. It was sitting near us because it was used to sitting near other monkeys. And it was used to feeding on good things, relying on them being brought to them. But it did not have any thinking processes. And if we did not have doctrines, teachings, we would have no thinking processes. So when people say, wouldn't it be wonderful just to have nothing, to have to cause discussion, to cause division, that we could just be together. If it was like that, it would be like a monkey sanctuary. And really, it would be just like having rubbish. There wouldn't be anything there at all of any use to us, to help us. In fact, there are human beings that like to think they live in this kind of atmosphere, but really it is rubbish that they're living with. I'm sorry it's just such a strong word. And the people that I'm thinking about today would call themselves humanists. And they just believe that there's good in everyone, and all you have to do is encourage that good. We don't have to have arguments or discussions or thoughts. We just live together. And they believe that we love each other. If we work to take away the debt from people, if we give children a better education, then we would find that all the good would come up in people and we would have a world with no divisions, no quarrels, no arguments, no Christian hypocrisy, 
and what a wonderful world it would be. But you can see by that that they haven't even started on God's stepladder. And what they've got will amount to nothing because we know that God says something different. It's not possible for us to have a good life just making up our own ideas about the human race and what the human race should do. And so this is how they're living. But now I want to take you onto the next rung of the ladder. We're on rung one. And rung one is going to be looking at the things that God has introduced into the world for us. So we're not living in a neutral world now. We're living on rung one where God has put into the human race the ability to think, the faculty to think as he did when we were created. He's given us the the concept of thoughtfulness, of questioning, of asking, but he's also put something else into our minds which is very valuable. And God has given us a gift that the Bible calls enmity. And that enmity is the thing that really triggers our questions. Without that, we'd never move from the bottom. But with that enmity, that God has given as a gift to every human being, we now begin to think, why do we have all this problem? I don't want to live like this. Isn't there something better than this? Where do we go from here? Why do we have evil? Where did it originate? How will it all end? God put that enmity in the human race so that we wouldn't just live in a comfort zone of nothing like down at ground level. God is trying to lift us up and take us out from that nothingness into something meaningful. There's a story told of a mother eagle. And when the mother eagle builds her nest, it's on the side of a cliff, maybe on a steep ravine, and she just builds it on a ledge just with some few sticks on the outside and some thorns and things that she's collected. And inside, there's all the wonderful down from her coat, from her feathers, and she fills the nest. She lays her eggs in there, and then she brings the food to the nest. And the little chicks hatch, and the little chicks are very comfortable. They've got it made, as we would say. And they have their food brought them, They've got a comfortable bed, they've got a good view, and life is wonderful. But then one day, mother thinks, I need to bring some enmity into this situation because these little birds have got to grow and develop. And so what she does is pull out all the soft feathers out of the little bird's nest and leave it just sitting on twigs. Well, it doesn't like the twigs very much, and it sits on the side of the nest, lifting up its little feet, thinking, I don't like this. My nest has all changed. It's not good for me anymore. And then mother comes up and gives the little eagle a little push, so he's got to sit right on the edge of the nest. And that's where all the thorns are and the stronger branches that are not comfortable to stand on doesn't like it there very much. And then one day, he doesn't see it happening, but Mother Eagle comes from the sky, and you know how a bird of, <clears throat> how a bird of prey comes down at a great speed from the sky. She does that for her baby, and she knocks it right off the nest. Oh, it turns somersault, it turns sideways, and then it discovers that it can flap. And then when it's learning that, it begins to discover that I might be able to fly, but I'm falling, I'm dropping. And then she comes right underneath him and takes little baby eagle on her back and takes it back up to the nest. And the next day she does the same thing. And the next day she does the same thing, but she doesn't bring it any food the next day. And then the day after that, little eagle has got to fly. It's got to go. And that's what God does to us. 
He tries to take us out of our comfort zone where we think love is everything. The human race is good. We're doing all right. God takes us out of that by putting enmity in our hearts to make us question why are we here? What is all this about? Where did we start? What are the origins of it all? And so without realizing, we're actually beginning to develop what we call teachings and doctrines. I wonder whether you've thought recently what the 28 fundamentals might be. If I was to ask you to take a piece of paper and a pen, I wonder how many of the 28 you'd be able to write down. It's quite a good test to see because we think we know what we believe. But this is how I read it in the North American Division paper. And I read the 28 fundamentals as they wrote them down. And it begins with the question, did you know? Did you know number one? Did you know number two, etc.? So I'm going to read you the 28 fundamentals. Did you know God speaks to us through the Bible? Did you know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one eternal God and they coexist? Did you know God is a Father? Did you know Jesus Christ died, he was raised to life to save us? Did you know the Holy Spirit works to restore us and comfort us, to guide and protect us and sustain us in salvation? Did you know the world was made in just six days? Did you know you are awesomely created? Did you know there is an ongoing battle between good and evil? Or that someone paid the supreme price for your sins? Did you know you can be totally free? Did you know that God is more, more powerful than Satan? You're invited to be part of God's family on earth. God's people are to strive consistently to keep the commandments. Did you know that God has a place for you in his community? Did you know that God allows you to start your life all over again? Did you know there's a special celebration that expresses our closeness to God and our willingness to serve others? Did you know that God gives us special gifts, talents, so that we can live fully for him? Did you know that God speaks to his people today through the gift of prophecy? And God gives us the power to obey him. God gives us a special 24-hour period each week to rest and to reflect on him and to spend time with our families. Did you know God wants us to take care of everything that he has made and given us? He's given us guidelines for living well. He's designed our families. And Jesus Christ is our advocate and our judge. Did you know that Jesus is coming back to the earth? Did you know that death is only like a sleep? It's a state of unconsciousness. Did you know that God will one day bring an end to suffering and death? And did you know that we will live with God in our new home forever? I wonder what your reactions were as you heard those words. 28 fundamentals. Uh, did you notice things that might be missing? Did it seem complete to you or did it seem fairly shallow? When I read it, it seemed very shallow. Whereabouts is my high priest in the sanctuary? Whereabouts is the judgment that's taking place now and coming to an end? Where is the shaking of God's people, the sealing of God's people? our readiness for Jesus to come. And when Jesus comes to the earth, which is one of the 27 fundamentals, 28 fundamentals, will Jesus touch the earth when he returns? He will come towards this earth, but he won't actually come to the earth. 
I looked at these and I thought, with human words, it's so difficult to find out just how to express something of what we believe. There were lots of words in what I read you, but it seemed to miss the heart of what I consider Seventh-day Adventism to be. They were very difficult things to live by because they weren't personal. And as I thought about this, I thought, when we take a list like that, we can write it out so that it looks like that. Now, when you have something that looks like that, you can read one, two, three, and then you come to the fourth one and you think, I don't think I like that one very much. So I think I can forget that one. But five and six, that's all right. And so you can go through the list. And I know people that have been baptized believing only a very few of what's on that list. And they miss out some of the very crucial ones. We had a, a campaign in one of our towns where we used to live. And the campaign in that town was finished after three weeks. It moved very quickly to the church. And members that were interested were allocated different people to go and visit to give them more advanced Bible studies. And I had a young man called Stephen to go and visit. And I told him about the things that I was talking to you about, about the, the judgment and the shaking and the sealing and even things like giving our tenth to the Lord. And he said, nobody told me that before I was baptized. I don't have to do that. And I could not get him to move on to more than what he'd been baptized with. And he didn't want to know anything further. So this is one of the difficulties with having a list, which some people might call a creed. Because a list or a creed can never cover everything that we believe. This is what makes it difficult for people. Because when we go and give our Bible studies, we have our list in our mind. But the Lutheran gentleman may have his list in his mind. And then we start comparing two lists. And then the trouble begins. Because you can say, have you thought of that text in the book of Revelation? And he'll say, but I have another text which says something different. And then you end up with a battle of words. My text is better than your text. And the truth of Adventism, the present day truth of Adventism, begins to be lost. And this is one of the dangers of it. But even within Adventism, it gets more difficult than that, because let me show you. We have our teachings in Adventism, but then we make our own little pictures. And we sometimes develop our own little ideas about things. So we build together a collection of texts, and we build it up, and we make a whole picture of what we think is a doctrine. But then somebody else within the Adventist church comes along and says, I don't agree with you. And then you have two of you, each with your ideas. And can you see how much further it's gone from the original list? And it can get smaller and smaller with more and more detail and more and more difficulties in the conversations between different people. And I believe this is what's beginning to happen in the Adventist church today in some places. I can't speak for Denmark because we're from England, but in England, that's what we're finding. So over a fellowship lunch, you will find one group discussing their ideas and another group discussing their ideas and the cross of Christ is completely forgotten in the details of those discussions. It can almost become a kind of idolatry. It can become an exclusiveness that 
you believe that you are almost a theologian. Now, there's nothing wrong for you doing your Bible study and learning Bible texts, but we need a foundation to build on. And this is what's missing in these discussions. And then it goes to the other extreme sometimes because there are people that maybe have not had a very good education, people who live life on a much simpler level altogether, and they say, I can't understand it. If God is that hard, then I don't want to know because I can't explain it, I can't understand it, and I couldn't tell it to anybody else. And this is where the very real problems begin. And I know that the church at large has made a decision on this to try and make things more comfortable for people. And they have determined what is the, what they call the irreducible minimum. The minimum that we have to believe to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You couldn't take it any further, otherwise you'd have nothing. Uh, some pastors have arranged what they call the irreducible minimum. And that's where we have to think very carefully. Because when we've been talking so far, we've learned that really it isn't a minimum we're looking for, it's a growing experience with God, which is something quite different. And so we need to move on and think what it's all about. You see, there are people that say, what I believe is what the pioneers used to believe. That must be safe. But we've already had a message on present truth. The pioneers living in the 1840s, 1850s, are they living today? No, they're not. They're not living in today's situation. I know it's the everlasting gospel, but the everlasting gospel has to be appropriate for every advancing month of life. And so we must live in present truth. And sometimes what the pioneers spoke wasn't always the same way as we would word it today when we have more understanding of the signs of Christ's coming, more understanding of what Christ is doing in his sanctuary. We have a deeper and a richer understanding because everything that comes from the throne of God will get deeper and richer and deeper and richer right until the very end and continue all through eternity. Never does God want us to stop at any point in our understanding. So for myself, I would not say that I'm a historic Seventh-day Adventist. For me, I am a Seventh-day Adventist believing and teaching and working with present truth. And that's as far as I'm prepared to go at the present time. And so we need to have another think. I wonder whether it's time to begin to move to the next rung. You see, that first rung is purely, for many people, an intellectual exercise. And it's one that we think about, we learn, we have our proof texts, we have the scriptures, and we put it all together to make a picture of what an Adventist believes. But it can get locked into facts and figures of prophecy and all the different proof texts of the Bible. And this is why I believe we have so much emphasis on the standards of the church, what clothes you should wear, what foods you should eat, how much sleep you should get, how many hours of Bible study you should do, you know what I mean. We've all met these counseling aids to being a good Seventh-day Adventist. But in the main, that is all on rung one, where it is intellectual, where it is factual, a little bit like the Pharisees who tithed the mint and the cumin. They weren't wrong. 
And I want you to know that what I'm saying about the, the facts and the memorizing and the theory, it is not wrong, but it's only the beginning of an experience. And if we stay at that beginning of the experience, we're like the Jews of old that said, the temple, the temple, the temple is the Lord's. And we can be just as strong in our thinking as they were about things like that. So let's think now about rung two, because you see here that we've got a small tree that we've brought in. Now, I'm going to hang on that tree. I have them here, I thought. Here they are. I want you to imagine that these are the doctrines that we've been talking about. And so, we'll start with the Sabbath. And we'll put the Sabbath on the tree. We'll add another one. We are Seventh-day Adventists, so we can hang the second coming of Jesus on the tree. And we also believe in paying tithe, which we've talked about. We also believe in the gospel of health, so we can add that on the tree. But we have Jesus, our high priest. And we have the sanctuary message. And we have those standards we talked about. We have the mission work that we have to do for God. So you can see that this tree, and I could add more, has many different of the teachings we had on the first rung. They've now moved up to the tree. And I'll tell you why. Because the tree brings all those teachings that we have as a Seventh-day Adventist people from what we know from the lists into a growing system, a living system of truth where everything all fits together. Could we be ready for Jesus to come if we hadn't overcome our sins, we couldn't. So there's another link we can make. We need to know about the, the great controversy. And so you see it, it's there. Now, when we've put them all on a tree like that, we have to ask ourselves, what does the tree represent? The tree represents Jesus Christ. Down here, it was the intellectual things that we discussed in Sabbath school lessons over lunch. But when we put them on the living tree, we discover that it is actually Jesus that we are talking about. I'm going to tie on the tree a golden thread. But Jesus told us that he was called the Word of God. So the doctrines that are about Jesus Christ are also found in the Word of God. So I have another golden thread which represents the Bible. And this is altogether a much healthier way of considering the doctrines that we teach. They're about Jesus, and they're all found in the Bible. So if you think of the teachings in the Bible and think of them as all about Jesus, then you are on safe ground. But what about the people that say, ah, but I'm a New Testament believer? I don't believe in the Old Testament. 
And we've met a few people like that. Did you know that it was the Spirit of Jesus Christ that inspired all the Old Testament as well? The whole Bible, everything written in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, reflects Jesus Christ. Jesus was the creator at the beginning. Jesus was the one that went to find Adam and Eve in their sin. Jesus is the one who's coming again and will take us into heaven to be with him, to have that tree of life once again. It's all about Jesus Christ. So our tree is the Alpha and the Omega. So when Jesus says, about the standards of the things that you wear, some of us, when we were younger, thought, I don't know whether I agree with that. But if you think of it as belonging to Jesus, what kind of people would Jesus like to have been friends with? Those that were modest or those that were immodest and loud? You know, I don't have to answer that question. When Jesus asks us to give him a tenth of our income, couldn't we even give him a bit more? He doesn't ask for more, but hasn't he given us everything? So is it any hardship to give back to Jesus? When he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it's his gift to us for our refreshment. Knowing that it came from Jesus with his love, is it any hardship to give him 24 hours so we can get to know him better? as our saviour and creator and friend. This is what Jesus is doing here. But everything we need to know is here. And Jesus said that he was not willing that any should perish. He knows that those that are in sin are heading for those final fires that we heard about earlier in the day. Those fires will destroy any body and anything that is not on the side of Christ. Even if you think have things hoarded away, when those tongues of flame touch your bank, it will be gone. The only thing that's safe that you can take to heaven with you is your character and the way in which you've shown that you love our Savior Jesus. Those are the things that are important for us. So Jesus wasn't just the humanist's idea of being good to one another. It wasn't the theory and the discussions and the sometimes the arguments about the doctrines on number one. It comes up to number two, where we find that Jesus is behind everything. It goes up again. And this rung, number three, is a very important one because here we need to ask ourselves, we know it in theory, we know it belongs to Jesus, but am I actually living it? Do you call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm sure many of you do. And if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, are you treasuring the Sabbath? Are you keeping the Sabbath? Is it a very special day? Or is it a day when you are watching the clock and thinking, Sabbath goes out in about 10 minutes. Mm, Sabbath goes out in about seven minutes. Five more minutes. Finger on the television button. One more minute to Sabbath out. A quick prayer and on goes the program you've been wanting to watch. I hope that nobody's Sabbath keeping is like that. But I have been a young person. But that's how it can be. If you call yourself an Adventist, that means that you are really looking forward to Jesus coming. We were looking forward to coming to Denmark. We made our preparations. We talked about it. We talked to Michael about how things were going to work out. We talked to each other. We booked the flights. There was so much in our thinking. We're going to Denmark. We're going to Denmark. We're going to Denmark tomorrow. We're going to Denmark today. We're there. And when we are Adventists, 
our thinking should be like that. We're going to meet Jesus. We're going to find the Jesus behind all the things that we've ever learned and taught. The Jesus behind those doctrines. Forget that word doctrine. It's just different facets of the photograph that Jesus has given us of himself and hoping that we will want to be like him. That's what he's doing. So if we call ourselves Adventists, we'll be making preparations. On our knees in the morning, we should say, Lord, I know today about 11 o'clock, I'm going to be meeting so-and-so. And that person, when I meet them, always gets me angry. I don't know what it is about that person, but I'm never comfortable with them. I feel my shoulders go up, I feel my fists close in, and I just, I just want it over with. And Lord, I know at 11 o'clock today, I could be and do and say something that you wouldn't like. Please help me. Please take that visit, that meeting, that interview that we're going to have, and make it be Christ-like. We need, that's like putting your things in a case, ready to pack. We need to think of our lives as practically as that. For a number of years, I kept a small notebook. And in that notebook, I had divided my day into the hours. And then I had divided it into the days of the week. And I noted in there the times ahead when there would be problems that I knew were coming up. I noted the times each day when I'd said, Lord, I need to talk to you at that time about this plan for the afternoon or whatever I was going to do. I knew a very elderly lady and she taught me that trick, but she didn't write it down. But before she went out shopping, she'd say, Lord, I've only got 10 pounds in my pocket and I need all the shopping for the week and I want to take something to the fellowship lunch and I want to give my neighbor something who's ill. Please make that 10 pounds go as far as possible. And she would go round to where the shops were. She'd walk round and she'd say, Lord, which shop do you want me to go into first? And I know the Lord spoke to her because she'd walk into the shop and there she would see on special offer just the bunch of grapes that she wanted for the sick lady that she wanted to visit. And then she'd say, Lord, that was so good. That was half the price I expected. And they're such good quality. And then she'd go a little bit further around the shop and she'd say, now, Lord, I've got this on my list, but is this a good idea? Or do you want me to think of something else? And she said, the Lord went with her all through the day. And there was one particular day where she had set her heart on buying one of the postluck ladies a new saucepan to make things easier, a nice big one. And there it was, right in the front of the charity shop. Now, I don't know whether you have them in Denmark, but there are shops where the money will go to help arthritis or the money will go to help cancer. But right in front of the window was this big pot. And she said she got off the bus and the Lord said to her, that's your pot. I put it there for you. Can you see it? And she rejoiced and she said, Lord, it's the pot that I wanted for the lady that does the potlucks at church that always has to have two pots that never quite fit on the one ring of flame. This will make it easier. And she went to the shop. It was closed. She was so disappointed. She told me all this afterwards. And she prayed and she prayed. And then she read on the door that it was due to sickness that the shop was closed, but it was going to be open the next morning. She was straight there. She was there first thing as the door opened because God had shown her the pot that she had asked for. And if ever at church somebody asked for a testimony meeting, she had a testimony about the living Jesus. To her, it didn't matter about the doctrine and the proof texts for everything. She knew them because she was an old Adventist, but she'd moved beyond that up to knowing that it was all Jesus and now beginning to live like Jesus. She was on the third rung of the ladder 
And when it was testimony time, nobody wanted her to stop because she was alive with a living witness. I can see her to this day. She was like a little bird with big bright eyes that just shone with the love of God. She'll be wonderful for you all to meet in heaven. But is your tree about Jesus, is it living in your heart? Do you know why God's commandments are good? Do you know why the resurrection is good? I'll tell you why the doctrine of the resurrection is good. It's because when we are resurrected, the spirit of the resurrection that's in our hearts now will come awake when Jesus calls us. When we have the Spirit of God come into our lives, we become part of the fellowship of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when the Lord comes in that cloud of glory and calls, awake, 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 then at that point, your spirit of the fellowship of resurrection will awake in you and you will stand up out of the grave because that's what resurrection means to come to standing up from lying down and you will come forth singing knowing about the resurrection is not just theory when we keep the commandments of god it's like a hedge about us it's very safe when you live within the commandments of god you know that if you are in there the evil one cannot touch your character he may touch your body as time goes on. He may try to touch you with rheumatisms, cancers, tortures, whatever. The body he can kill. But if you live in your heart and your mind within the commandments of God, you are completely safe. You are graven on the hands of God and there you are safe like a little baby bird in the hands of God, safe right through to the end. And it's what's in here that the Lord can then give a beautiful new body to and take you into his kingdom. This is what it means to live the doctrines that we know. Isn't this far more positive than wrangling over my text is better than your text? I'm not talking to you about this again. That is hopeless and fruitless and destroying. It is the devil that is destructive. God is a God of life and knowing and understanding these things. But when we have done all these things, then there is another step to come. You've seen this clock on the side and probably wondered what it was for. It was one of the things that I asked whether it could be put in place for me. Is that the right way up? Right, okay. So there, what time is the clock telling? 12 o'clock. And 12 o'clock is when the two hands meet and if you like, that's when Christ can come. Now, let me explain the two hands. One hand is your life. If your life was not quite ready, would God have a complete picture? God is asking you to put everything ready in your life. Have you got to do it by yourself? No. The Lord will help you. The Lord will make it possible for that hand to come up to the 12 so that you will be ready. But what would happen if the other hand was not quite ready? That is your mission work. If you had not done the mission work that you were supposed to, would the two come together? 
Would you be ready for Jesus to come? Could Jesus come if you hadn't finished your mission work? No, he could not. And so what the Lord is looking for is people who will be ready and people who will have finished their mission work. When Jesus was on earth, he said in John chapter 17, verse 4, I have finished the work that thou hast given me to do. Years ago, when I was a little girl, people used to pray earnestly from the pulpit that we would finish the work, that we would hasten the work of God to its conclusion. I don't hear those words very much these days. But God wants this work completed. He wants the life completed. And when our work and our life meet, all for all of us, then the Lord can come and take us home. This is what God is waiting for. And I have a quotation I would like to read to you. This quotation says, and it's from early writings, I believe, I saw angels hurrying to and fro. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. So the angels are also working to prepare a people for Jesus coming. The angels are looking for a forehead big enough to take the seal of our Father's character. A narrow forehead filled with all sorts of human thoughts and error will never be able to be big enough to take the seal of our Father. But the angel goes back into heaven and says his work was done. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raises his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. It is done. The teachings have done their work. The understanding has done its work. God's people have lived by what he's tried to teach them. They've gone into the world with their missionary work because one of the doctrines says, go ye into all the world and teach them whatsoever things I have commanded you, what Jesus has commanded us, go into all the world and teach. The angel will come back when the very last person has the Father's seal placed on their forehead and come back to Jesus and say, it is done. Don't you want that time to come? We go on from one day to the next, going through the usual round, studying our Sabbath school lessons, saying our prayers, talking to the next door neighbor a little bit maybe, but the angels in heaven are going to and fro, watching to see who is ready, who is like the hands on the clock, who has done their work, their mission work, and whose character is ready. And then the seal of God. It's not a seal that can be seen, but it is a seal that means that we are unshakable. We're settled into the truth. We're unshakable from the truth. We are safe for God to take into heaven. And when Christ raises his hands and drops the censer of his high priestly ministry, and he can say with a loud voice, it is done. Christ, who was crucified on that cross from the foundation of the world, will now have to bear it no longer. The censer is thrown down. No longer will he have to add his merits to our prayers because of our sins. The time is coming when we will see the king in all his beauty. We shall see our savior face to face in all his glory. That time's coming. How ready are you? 
The angels are keeping count of who they are looking for in this world. They're watching with eager eyes. There is that brother there. He's so close to being ready. If he would just make that last decision to be true to the Lord. Or there is that sister that's still got that grudge that she hasn't yet given up. If only she could let that go, then I would be ready. And this is why the Holy Spirit is pleading with us, do it today, do it today, do it now. Because when this happens, and this clock is in the right place, then the Lord can pour out the latter rain onto the world. You've often wondered why all the work you've done, all those tracts you've given out, all the words that have been spoken, the DVDs that you've shared with people, why are we not seeing any results from them? Why do we not have a room full today? That's because the latter rain has not yet been poured out. And I believe when God pours out his spirit in its fullness, then there will be surprises that we never dreamt of. On the day of Pentecost, there were thousands. The following day, there were thousands more, and many of the priests believed. And when those final days come, there will be people that we would never have believed would have come onto the side of Christ. All God is asking us to do now is to get our lives right by coming up this staircase of doctrines that he's given us in the scriptures, looking to Jesus, finish our missionary work, and become like Jesus, so that both our lives and the tree and the stepladder all match in one big system of God's plan. Will you make a decision today that you want to move up this ladder? I don't know where you are on this ladder. If you're not even started on the ladder, I advise you now, do it quickly. Move off what the world is saying. Move from the theory and its discussions. Move into discovering what it tells you about Jesus. And then move into living it. And finally, finishing the work that God has given us to do. Jesus finished his work. He said, it is finished when he died on the cross. He's waiting for us to finish our work so he can say, it is done. Would you like that day to come? Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Our Father, thou hast heard the solemn words that have been spoken this afternoon. I pray that the images before us may not be lightly forgotten. I pray that each of us, even those who have spoken words this weekend, that we may be touched by the things that have been read, the things that have been discussed, that each one of us may encourage one another and take the hand of our brother and grasp our sister and walk together along that road of mission and learning about you. Father, please bless each one, older and younger, that are here today. In Jesus' name. Amen.